can I say? Welcome back, everybody. I hope if you if you are coming back, if you're new, welcome. If you are returning, welcome back. Uh, I'm Ray, and today you will be listening to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. Uh, I'll be reviewing some recent and classic Lit RPG stories for you. Hope you enjoy them. I try to be fair as always and give you some insights into the craziness that goes on in this here mind of mine. So check them out. We're going to start in just a few seconds. Welcome to my doom. All right. Next book is Raise, the Completionist Chronicles, book four. By who? You know who. Dakota Kraut, maybe. Uh Uh-huh. Dakota Kraut. With a book length of 10 hours, 28 minutes, and a narration by Luke Daniels. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. The gift you have been granted must be magical synesthesia. I was wondering what you would earn. I know you are keeping your eyes off of your notifications out of politeness, but I would look into that more closely when you leave here. As a secondary gift, let me increase the land allotment that you earned from the part you played in that little war. Joe heard a ding, but again refrained from looking over at the blinking notification. The king spoke to the room at large after sitting down his motion calculated to force clapping to a halt so that his words would have maximum impact on the gathering. My people, we are here today to honor a man that not only played a large part in ending the Wolfman uprising, but also saved my very life. Okay, so I have to give credit where credit is completely due. Um, Dakota Kraut, he played this right smartly. Mm-hmm. Just like that. He played it really well, knowing that he had a big issue with his narrator, who had been doing the series, who will not be named by me. Uh, bad blood, anger, issues for me. Um, Bruce Banner here right now. So I'm, I'm going to not mention his name. Um, but uh, he decided to crush this issue with like his iron boot in a really wise way. Magical synesthesia. Yep, yep, you know, those two words completely eradicate all of the issues of he who shall not be named, and I don't mean Lord Voldemort, uh, his departure caused. Um, So let me just start right there with the narration. Luke Daniels really steps up and sinks his teeth into this story. And now that he is somewhat unfettered by the accents, vocal tones, and pronunciations by the characters in the world, he forges ahead and takes his story home. Um, I really enjoyed listening to him, and somehow just the knowledge that magical synesthesia is a thing kept me from lamenting what could have been. Honestly, if it had not been something that was like literally written into the story, I would have just said this is, it, it still bothers me, it bugs me, but this, it literally, and I, I say that word a lot, but I mean it, it literally made me realize how unimportant he who shall not be named really is to this story's continuation. So, you know, just something simple like that, it just kept me from lamenting so many things. I was also thinking that it was used pretty slyly in other places in the story, so that it wasn't just like a one-trick pony, so to speak. Um, Daniels, he kind of hits all the jokes and doesn't flinch when it comes to the violence, so good on him. Um, if you know anything about him, he is really good with, like, sex and violence and, and funny business. Uh, maybe combining all three of those at the same time, even. I don't know. Um, anyway, um, I was happy he was able to do a series, the series, in spite of everything that's come before. My real issue comes, um, if I have any complaints about Luke whatsoever, and I'm going to just say, even though I, I just kind of said medical, magical synesthesia kind of erased that thing, is that some of the names are not pronounced the same, and and, and that's the only thing I wish that could have been fixed prior to recording. It, it just seems to me like that's a simple thing. Like you say, how do you say this name? Rather than, I'm going to just use it, you know, I'll just make it up with my own pronunciation. Carry over a little bit, just, just a smidge of continuity to help us, because it throws me off as a listener, and if it does it to me, I know it does it to other people. Um, trying to figure out who the hell you're talking about sometimes, because if you're talking about Bob, and the next thing you're talking about is Bob, I'm like, who the hell's Bob? I have no clue, and that's a, and that's an exaggeration, but it's very, very much kosher to this concept. So, like I said, it could have been simply fixed by just kind of saying, 
here's a pronunciation guide for these names. Flow with it. Um, the story is pretty funny uh, and deals with Joe struggling to be treated fairly by his guild and taking care of a problem the royal family has, all the while struggling to come up with a way to feed his guildmates as a horde of newbies rush in from the real world outside, following like some really bad apocalyptic stuff happening in the real world, of course. Um, I really thought that the manner in which Rexus and Raised kind of got tied together, there was like a, a melding of the, the meeting from the, 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 the Rexus story here, and it was pretty smartly done. I, you know, I think that it was it was perfect because it didn't do too much from this, but it made it, okay, this scene took place. It was kind of like watching a Quentin Tarantino movie where you get like a percept, you get a, a perspective from this person's point of view, and then later on the same thing happens, but you're getting it from this other person's POV. And I like that. Um, and not only that, Joe even has, of all the things to be happy about, he has an opportunity to earn a coffee elemental. Oh, so good. Man, I, I just, I think I would hate to get a half calf frap. Is it frap or frappe? In the nuts from one of those guys. Because it would be like that lady from McDonald's who spilled the coffee. Can you imagine? No thanks. Um, the biggest issue that Joe has, other than dealing with his team, as usual, is trying to figure out a way to satisfy the royal family's request. Um, you know, getting his good good god deity out of jail and keeping his guild from committing treason. So there's a lot happening in this single story. Um, I would have thought it had been a lot longer than what it was, and it, it wasn't short, but I, I thought, man, there's so much that happened in the story. The book should have been really thick. I don't know if it was me typing, I would be wordy. And it would just be, you know, 10,000 words, uh, you know, 10,000 pages um, to get from here to there with what all he crams in here. So he's really good, he's concise, he's funny, and, and you know, there's a lot of stuff that comes back. Um, you know, so Joe doesn't succeed in all the ways, which is nice, because if he, he hit every mark every time, it would be kind of boring. But he does manage to do a few things, like earn new followers for the hidden god, and convert many shrines and temples to his cause, yes. It was also good to see a seed, and I will say this rather slyly, that was planted way back come to fruition in this book, and it deals with a green flame. And you may remember this happening and thinking, I wonder what the hell ever happened with that. Well, now you know. Now you get it. Now the only thing I have uh, an issue with in that respect is that Joe is a pretty active dude, and he has done a whole lot, whole very lot, um, and, and his leveling should be way off kilter for everybody else. In other words, if, if he started out at the same point as everyone else, um, his level should be a little bit higher or better or stronger than somebody else's. And if they weren't, and if they were there before him, he's probably caught up to him and it's worse pretty close. And the green flame thing, I keep going back and thinking, the, the green flame guy um, should not have been so overwhelmingly strong, regardless of where he was or what his abilities were or whatever, because... It, it took like an entire group to to try to take care of the guy, and 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 even that wasn't quite working. And I always go back to if you're going to make a bad guy come from something that happened back here, um, make it a reason why they're super uber powerful. Um, and I say super and uber, knowing that they mean the same thing, but I really want to convey how OP sometimes these bad guys can be in comparison to the hero who does like some hellacious stuff and should be a lot stronger than what they actually are most times. And, and so I, I don't like to see that happen, but it was still a good scene. It was a, a funny moment. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was good. I enjoyed it. That's just my critique. Am I allowed to do that in a review? Maybe I think so. Anyway, here is a recommendation followed by the final score. Um, Dakota, if you're listening, if you start a new series and it's going to be in the same vein as, you know, Divine Dungeon or The Completionist Chronicles, I want to ask you very seriously, um, you've got like an opportunity to reach out to numerous narrators. And it's not that I don't like Luke, um, but I really think that you should consider like Jonathan McLean from the Noobtown series. The guy is really great for funny. Um, he's brilliant, um, and, and he can do funny like nobody's funny business. Um, and, and I think that you're doing yourself a disservice because Luke is great, but he, he 
doesn't have the, the I mean, I'm going to say it like the the it factor that McLean has when it comes to the reading of the the jokes and stuff like that. Like Luke Luke does it does it well, but man, I just I, I have fallen in love with McLean and how well he is. He's got timing down. He's got riffs. He's got the the accents and things like that. So if you go to start a new series, and I know you, you've got worries and concerns, and Luke is a top tier narrator, make no mistake. I am going to recommend Jonathan McLean because the man kills it in Noobtown, and he would really be a great addition to your stuff. My final score for Rays. I don't think I get a raise this year. In fact, I know I didn't. So I'm going to have to give a raise to Dakota. Uh, my final score is 8.5 stars. This was a great novel. It had a nice wrap-up uh, that kind of stuck it to a few people. I always like to see people get stuck. And it also had Joe serving coffee from a coffee cart. And I, I have to say, that kind of goes right along with the character. It was, it was perfectly in line with who he is and what he does. So good on Joe serving that coffee uh, and, and winning the day by nefarious means because... Those are the best ways to win and stick it to somebody. All right, so I'm done with this review. I hope you enjoy the book. Pick it up. Listen to it. You will love it. You will laugh. And like I say, the magical synesthesia carries the day and really eliminates a lot of the other stuff. I just wish we could have had that happen earlier with, you know, um, Rexus, just to kind of get that out of the way and get it done because it would have carried over. Either way, brilliantly done. Really appreciated it. Get this book. So the next book is Swing Shift by William D. Arand. He kind of works with that Randy Darren fella. I don't know if you've noticed that or not lately. Um, anyway, it's narrated by who? Who? Say it. You can say it. Andrea Parsno. Oh, that's right. Andrea Parsno narrates this. It has a book length of 14 hours and 16 minutes. Groaning, Gus rubbed at his eyes. No matter how much he ground his fingers in, though, it wouldn't change the view. He sighed, then leaned his head back and stared up at the ceiling above him. The view there wasn't much better, honestly, unless you liked the stucco-perfect squares you found in office buildings. Getting to his feet, Gus went over to the coffee machine and wrapped it with a knuckle. The glass was cold, through and through. Which means that damn coffee's like ice. Muttering under his breath, Gus fished his mug out of the sink next to him, filled it with some of that black nastiness, and put it in the microwave. He flicked the popcorn button, then sighed and stared blankly into the appliance. As it rotated slowly, the pancakes porcelain cup was his whole world. So, really, there's no mystery here. I've been a fan of Arans. A fan of Arans, fan of Arans, for a mighty, mighty long time. And, and as much as I love his stuff, there was just something about Swing Shift that just really punched the right buttons for me. Now, I don't know if it's because it's such a departure from his normal stuff, or if it's because I love gritty, noir, and urban fantasy type stories. But this book just knocked my socks off. And my feet really stink, and so I need to put them back on. And I'll do that right after this segment, I promise. Um, but anyway, I enjoyed this whole premise and loved the Boogeyman main character. He was perfect. Perfect. The book worked so well that Iran actually had to let it file a tax return for itself. That's how hard that book worked. It earned its money. Okay? Now, the premise is... It really is pretty simple. Um, the modern world has paranormals and normals living side by side because, you know, uh, otherwise they'd be above each other or below and you can't have people walking on each other as they go through life. But anyway, um, the paras naturally are kept secret from the nor normies via like this MIB style mind wipe most of the time. And it doesn't always work, but they try. Um, unfortunately, they end up in conflict periodically and the MC, Gus, um, is the guy that works the graveyard shift, which, for the paranormal community, is the daytime, during the day. You know, noon is like their midnight. So, you know, he's up during the day. He doesn't have the same sleep patterns as them. He's always miserable and cranky. He doesn't feel right. Um, you know, just like everybody else that works the swing shift. Gotcha? Okay, uh, the story begins with a simple berserk troll, but things quickly spiral out of that control 
And uh, Gus picks up a couple of new partners to help him figure things out. And of course, if you know anything about books or noir or urban fantasy, what appears to be a simple incident is never a simple incident. It's always going to lead back somewhere to something bigger and scarier later on. And that's kind of what happens here. Not kind of. It's exactly what happens here. Who am I trying to fool? Not you guys, because I love you. My pretty babies, I love you guys so much. Anyway, um, I really liked how Iran came into this modern era for the series. Um, and the mix of the mystical and the mundane was really, really well balanced. It was, it was almost perfection on a stick. Um, I think that the fans of urban fantasy will love this series as much as the ones who just love lit RPG. Uh, the world is grounded in some solid rules and it has some interesting character types. Um, such as contractors, who have never really held a place before that I've ever read. Um, and if they did, it wasn't anything like this. It's, this is a very good, new, neat concept. Um, I love the contractor idea. It's pretty slick. And, and, and you almost have to kind of consider it like Faust with operating on multiple deals, uh, you know, with different types of entities. So, you know, like uh, Faust does not make just a deal with the devil. He also makes a deal with a couple of elementals and a couple of gin and a couple, you know, like that sort of thing. That's what the contractors do, and it's a smooth, sweet idea. Really like this. The other thing I want to say is, is this is is really perfect for people who like gritty, noirish kind of stuff. Um, it really that's. I mean, I grew up. I grew up listening to things like um, Johnny Dollar and watching the Maltese Falcon, uh, the Third Man with Orson Welles is one of my favorite films, uh, and this fits right into that slot. So perfectly. Um, you know, I mean, it really does. So if you like the noirish stuff, like Sam Spade, uh, you know, uh, those kind of movies, you, you know, they really, really kind of fit right here. It's a good piece, but it's also updated. So while it doesn't have um, that 30 sensibility, well, it does. It has a 30 sensibility set in modern day. Uh, Gus is very much Sam Spade, um, you know, in the modern world, but he's also Sam Spade in the magic world. So it's, it's a lot like Cast a Deadly Spell, but more updated. So if you've ever seen like HBO's perfectly and brilliant Cast a Deadly Spell with Fred Ward, which is based on like a kind of Lovecraftian kind of uh, setting, which is, uh, uh, you, if you know me, I love Lovecraft. He's my top horror guy. Uh, that is probably one of the best um, singular creations for an urban fantasy world that I've ever seen put on screen. Uh, it really is. Like, I, I don't think I've ever seen a better urban fantasy, even though it's set in, you know, in an era not really close to our present day. It works so well. And Fred Ward is so perfect. I wish this guy had become a, a major movie star. And this is the feeling I get with Gus. When I hear Gus talk, I see Fred Ward um, with his, you know, his shabby, downbeaten kind of uh, detective, you know, PI, kind of trying to figure things out. That's Gus to a T. I mean, just it's it's so good, um, and his attitude is really just perfect for this. And so, like I say, Arand really, really captures the feel and the and the the ambiance of that kind of setting. So, you know, urban fantasy, big fan, great. If you like noir and detective stories, great. If you like gritty, um, magic field stuff right up there uh, you know it, it's is it lit yeah i mean he's he's got things he does it's not lit rpg per se uh, other than the fact that it's set in his his world and so being that you know it's it's in the the runner's verse you know um it's going to count uh but it's still it's still great i mean i love this story so much andrea parsno rocks this like she's on a boat and i mean don't rock the boat baby and she gives gus a, a kind of perfect everyday kind of schlub kind of voice that fits him to an absolute T. Um, Gus is pretty steady and, and on an even keel most of the time to keep with the boat theme, if you get what I'm going here. And it takes a lot to get him either upset or super excited. You know, getting shot, he's like, man, man, I, I've been shot, you know. Um, Andrea plays Gus so well, which is not to say that she doesn't nail the other characters too, but the MC literally sets the tone and it's just like she nails Brawley's voice in Power Mage, and she completely captures the essence of Gus with her voice. Um, she's kind of taken to reading um, her books if, as if it were from the MC's point of view, telling the whole story. And I give her kudos. And, and I know that she said um, in one of the, the Facebook 
post that she had put that she had done that with Power Mage um, just because the book was kind of written in Brawley's voice. And I can almost say that she said the same thing here. She's like, well, this is, is set with Gus's tone. It's his perspective. Uh, I should probably do this in his voice. And I loved it. At the same time, I before I... I I've already reviewed a book prior to this review um, stating how much after I'd read like the, the Power Mage one and then this book, she had gone back to her regular voice. And I thought, man, you know, Andrea just just makes me want to listen to her in her own voice telling the story as much as I want to hear her doing the story in the main character's voice. Um, it's an amazing ability to do that because most of the time you get somebody and you say, I just want to hear them do that in this particular way. Andrea has a bag of tricks that is bottomless. I'm just learning that she continues to grow every single time she does a book. Um, she strives to improve, and it's very obvious. Um, and I have to say, it can't be easy speaking in a voice that is not your own for like 95% of the book. Oh, and the other 5%, not 5% of the time, you're usually doing other characters who really aren't your own voice anyway, unless you manage to squeak one in. Uh, so she really does do this so well. Um for me, it just had that feeling of the OTR, the old-time radio OTR. I get talking jargon here. Um, Johnny Dollar story type. It's total fun. And Andrea is the best here. Um, and like I say, I grew up um, with my grandmother listening to OTR, old-time radio shows. Um, she had recordings and stuff like this. Uh, and, and we kind of, as as we got into the CD age, I would go out and buy uh, the, the, the compact disc sets of certain things just so we could listen to them. Uh, I have a lot of shadow. I, I love the shadow. Um, but uh, we would listen to those things over and over and over again. And it's not just like the superhero or the horror. You know, and this is one of those things that I could see this being a radio show way back in the 40s. It would have been perfect for the radio show uh, because it is so visual. When you hear it being told to you, you can just see everything so clearly. Um, and it, it lacks, the only thing it lacks is like the sound effects. And I don't need those. I don't need to hear gunshots. Because you would hear that in the OTR stuff. You know, pew, 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 pew. Ah, you know, you would get all that. Um, but I don't need that here. Uh, because the writing is so perfect and the narration is so amazing. It works out. It's just as good as OTR. But way better. Way better. Final score um, is 8.3 stars. And you're probably going, Ray, you're just raving about this. It's a great first novel. It's got some really cool chapters. My only hang-up... Here's my only hang up for the story is that there's a point where the contractor gets kind of sent away and I don't want to spoil anything, but I needed to see the contractor in action more than, than we did when, when we needed them the most. Um, that's all I can tell you. I don't want to spoil it, but and I can get, you know, the contractor seems to be really OP, really, really overpowered in some ways. And, and it, it's not in a bad way at all, but the inclusion in the story could have disrupted some stuff because there were things the, the the contractor could have done, I'm sure, that would have made life a little bit easier for everybody. And it also gave the other characters time to shine. But damn, I wanted to see more of the contractor in action. And the other thing is, is like the contractor and her employer that we, we see earlier on in the book um, are supposed to be these terrifyingly amazing people. Like when you talk to them, you're like, holy crap. And I, and I, just kind of felt like their presence wasn't as overwhelming as it could have been. You know, like um, after he talked to the one guy that was the employer of the contractor at the start, um, I, I didn't get like this ominous sense of, oh, he's in danger. You know, this is this is not going to work out well for him later on. There's going to be more. And that's OK. I mean, it's hard to do that with just like a couple of appearances and things like that. But those those few things, you know, like I say, taking the contractor away and the lack of of ominousity, I don't know how to do <laughs> ominousness, um, just really didn't strike me as well. But I mean, it's 8.3. This is an incredibly good story. I really enjoyed this, and I loved having that feeling going back to OTR. There are some books that do that for me. Uh, this one especially. Uh, I can almost say Power Mage does it just because she reads it like that. Um, but it doesn't quite hit that mark for me as OTR kind of style stuff. This really, really, really has Sam Spade and Johnny Dollar and, you know, just those those kind of characters coming to the fore, you know, like the Maltese Falcon kind of thing, um, with the MacGuffins and, and stuff like that. It really does have that kind of tone and quality, 
And I love this book to pieces. I really can't wait to, to, to listen to Monster's Mercy. I mean, that's one of those books, like, now that I, I know it's out there and people are raving about it, having listened to uh, Randy Darren, uh, his recent book, <laughs> yeah, I know who they are. I really, I do, I do. I like to play along. Okay, and then this book by Rand, um, I, I'm just, I'm stunned at the quality that, that Rand and, and his cohort are, are creating uh, because it just can't, seems to escalate. Most times, writers who do multiple series kind of trickle down as time goes on. Like, you know, for example, Lawrence Watt Evans, my favorite authors of all time for fantasy, has this great arc for about five books. And then his S Shar books just kind of drop in, in, uh, in tone and quality and humor. Uh, and they aren't the same. And you almost can say he doesn't have the same love for it, but it's like his biggest selling series. So he, he kind of keeps it alive because people want it. And I've been disappointed time and time again after certain books like Night, Night of Madness. It was the story that should have never been told. And, and so on and so forth. Those things just kind of trail. Rand does not suffer from fatigue. I don't know how he does it. I don't know. He has to have a notebook that thick with ideas that he just sets down and says, okay, where are we going to go on to today? Boom. And the Runiverse expands ever bigger. Uh, and, and like I say, the, the, the one thing I will say about the Runiverse is it's getting really big. There's a lot of characters, and I know it's not like an Avengers style, we're going to get these superheroes together kind of thing. But you've got a lot of characters you're going to have to mush together into the the, the final book's that will kind of close the Runiverse out if that's what you plan on doing. I mean, you know, we know where it's kind of headed at. So I'm really curious to see how he works this out. But otherwise, 8.3 stars, incredible, and I'm raving about it. You can see I'm still talking five minutes after I've told you how much I enjoyed the book the first time. 8.3 stars, just a couple little things I had to nitpick, but otherwise, it's perfection. So, for my sound boot spotlight, I'm doing a relevant jack by Prax Venter. Narrated by three of the greatest, greatest narrators I've heard. Justin Thomas James, Jeff Hayes, and Andrea Parsnow. Book length of 11 hours, 42 minutes. Thick, icy raindrops splattered against his naked skin, and his head throbbed like his brain was too big for his skull. Combined with lacerations, Jack was experiencing the worst pain he had ever felt. He laid where he landed, motionless, blinking up into the rain. He tried to figure out what was happening to him, but between the explosives in his head and the stinging, ripped flesh on the back half of his body, he was having a hard time focusing. In fact, Jack thought it was a much better idea to take a little nap instead of dealing with any of this. His eyelids grew heavy and were in the process of surrendering to the darkness that wanted to obscure all sights and thoughts, when he noticed a woman with dripping wet hair was looking down on him. Jack tried to reach out to the woman, just as her terrified face and an impossible tower behind her were both illuminated by a flash of lightning. So may I say wow, this total wow. Prax Venture took a break from doing harem and stepped into some hardcore lit RPG that features both town building and tower climbing as the main components of the tale. Pretty smart and pretty slick how he does it. I'm very pleasantly surprised and maybe a little shocked that he opted to go for the more family-friendly version. Um, but while sex sells, Disney does own everything, so I get it. Um, here, uh, the MC is a bit of a nonconformist who hates to follow the rules. He has an aversion towards the authority figures and doesn't like being told what to do. I don't know anybody like that at all. As a result, oh, and, and I so understand this guy to the core. Like I say, he ends up doing stupid stuff and getting himself stuck into a spaceship that hasn't trapped, been trapped underground for countless thousands of years. Then he has to go off and, and fight an organism that mimics other creatures and can only be killed by fire. Um, I'm sorry, that's the thing. That's the thing. Um, damn, I love that movie. Anyway, uh, the MC does stumble into a space vessel and finds himself inserted into a VR world. Uh, he soon discovers uh, that the world he is in is under attack by a corruption from the real world. Uh, and he is the only hope both the real world and the virtual world have of defeating this dimensional eating stuff. Uh, the story is well paced and has some intriguing characters, um, but it also does one hell of a job world building and setting up future books. 
One thing I liked is how the MC doesn't flip from being a self-centered jerk to doing the right thing quickly. Um, and it's something that he later acknowledges in the book, that if he'd done things his way, he would have probably died right off the bat from his own arrogance and lack of listening skills. Uh, Venter treats this very, very well, and, and it is some solid character growth to see. Uh, that was a nice nice way to watch it develop. I enjoyed that a lot. I also liked the, compar the, the companion, like the comparison, I like the companion that, that the MC gets. Not the girl, but the AI. I mean, I like the girl, too. I mean, she's good. But um, the AI, AI was funny, uh, and it was a good source of info that got parsed out as he grew in power and could access more systems of the ship. Um, it, it sure beat one large info dump, which we could have had. This is, like I say, um, if you, you, you want to do a backstory, just slip it in little bits at a time, and it works better. And that's how you do that. You do it that way, and it works. Um, and this is that this is that book that proves that it was a little bits here and there, rather than doing a great big info dump or taking an hour to get me to that point where I could get into this. It all happened, and it was all done in transition within the game, very smartly. Um, so it was pretty good. Uh, the girls of his, the girls, the girl. This is is a Prax Venter book, but it's a girl. The girl of his dream was also his dream dreams she's like in his dreams she's a hot chick um the girl of his dreams was also played out pretty well as in she didn't fall for him right off the bat and had trust issues with him throughout most of the book realistic very realistic um issues that were completely completely understandable uh the townspeople have vibrant personalities and they all stood out my only complaint was i couldn't tell if the village had only a handful of people left in it or if the book had only spotlighted that handful of people for the expedient's sake, and then there's more people in the background, it's going to show up as the, 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 the town gets bigger and, you know, better as it, as it goes. Um, it could go either way. Uh, and if the former is true, then where will the people come from? If there's only like a handful of people, where will they come from as the town grows? I don't know. I guess we're going to see. Uh, the narration is amazing complete with some sound effects, but it's not enough to be overwhelming. And that, that's what I like best. You know, they had like the Star Trek beam in as they went in and out of the tower. Um, that was cool. And like I say, there, there were bits to it, but it wasn't like this overwhelming bunch of just noise every 10 seconds as, as you listened. Um, so that was sweet, very sweet. Um, and, and I just had to say, um, I love the smooth vocal tones of Justin Thomas James narration, and thought that Hayes' voicing of Jack was just about perfect. Hayes seems to do Incredulous very well. So well. So, so very well. Um, plus, he's full of snark in real life, and that kind of transfers over into the, the narration for those kind of characters. Um, the big surprise for me here is that Andrea Parsnow comes on board to do the female voices, and naturally, this is a three-way I'm happy to have experienced. Um, let me clarify. It's, <laughs> it's like three of my favorite narrators kind of came together to make an audiobook just for me. Just for me. And it is just for me. And I'm not stingy. So I'm a share with y'all. But it's for me. I'm just letting you listen. So I don't know if you get the hints I'm a dropping, but this is a hell of a good bunch of narration that goes on here. I rather like this SBT lineup better than the team up. Um, I just think this was it was a, it was a great shock to find out Andrea had done this, and you know I, you know I like like Jeff Hayes is like my favorite narrator of all time, and, and and Andrea is right there, and then Justin Thomas James, I mean like for me this is the trifecta of voiceovers, um, just amazing stuff, and I, I'm like I can't believe that they did this, uh, yeah, it, it, if I had any complaints about the book whatsoever, um, the 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 fact is is that. You, you go into the tower and you have to clear the floors. So it's like you finish floor one and you get to floor two. You finish floor two, you get to floor three. And so your level was based on like how many floors you've completed. And we did a lot of level one, level one, level one, level two, level two, level two, like that. I would have rather just kind of jumped in and said, okay, he made it to, to level three and here's what's happening. That would have worked better, and maybe like in in book two or three. And again, I don't know the books because I I, I just do audio. Um, maybe that's what happens. I don't know. Um, but again, I, I think that um, that was the only thing I really kind of said. Okay, I, I really couldn't care less 
about the, the, the things that are on floor one for the 18th time. Now, grant you, um, he has a reason to experience new monsters and attack new monsters continuously because there's, there's a very big bonus for Jack, who is irrelevant, uh, only in the sense that it doesn't really matter what kind of a hero he is. That's what the whole irrelevant means. Um, you know, each, each hero that's there has a different type of hero type, Jack is just so badass. Um, it really doesn't matter what you call him. He's a hero. He's the hero. He is the hero they want and they need and they deserve. Damn it. He's Batman. Anyway, um, that was like my only issue with the book was like, I, I, I just don't like repetition. Um, and then going from floor to floor to floor repetitively, that was kind of it. But otherwise, it worked really well. And I like how he sticks it to one of the characters in the village. And then you know, the character gets upset about it. That was fun. Because I said, well, you know, he's if he can do it, he should he totally should smoke that guy. And then I said, oh, but if he smokes that guy, that dude's going to get mad. Because he's got an attitude. From day one, he had an attitude. And I was right. Because I know things. Anyway, <laughs> my final score, 8.3 stars. Good story, good characters, good narration. All combined into one magical mystery tour that is an incredible tale of one man's struggle to save everything he knows. I enjoyed this book a lot, and, and I give Prax Venter a, Venter a lot of credit for stepping outside of his comfort zone and going for a quote-unquote normal lit RPG as aside from the harem. Um, because as great as his harem stuff is, I think this, um, and he has some really good ideas like time dilation in his his, his other books, is brilliantly used. Um here, it's it's a standard, family-friendly lit RPG. My kids can and have listened to this book, um, just snippets of it, because they can't be with me all the time as I'm listening to things. But I had no problem with them hearing this book, and it's worth the time. Check it out. Check it out now. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that as much as I did. There were some really amazing books on today's show. I hope you give them all a good try. Uh, I had fun listening to them. I think that you will, too. I just thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate you taking time to, to listen or watch the show. If you want to support us, as always, you can like the Lit RPG podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page or just share and like the video. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed the program. Please, as always, I ask you to leave comments or suggestions down below here. And remember, I enjoy feedback immensely. I like to interact with people. Uh, I am a people person. As much as I am a misanthropic hermit in my real life, on, on in the internet, I'm a people person. I'm a loving guy. Believe it or not, anyway, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. I was going to say Sketcher, but that's not right. It's just not right. Remember, always leave a review for anything you've listened to or read. Authors depend on reviews. They need them for their books to continue and for them to continue writing. Review, review, review. All the time. Review it. Okay? I'm just going to say it one time. Review it. Just do it. I say just review it. That's right, baby. Anyway, for the RPG audiobook podcast, this guy is Ray, and I say keep listening.